Many African-American women are proud of their size. Even in pop culture, songs like Bootylicious from Beyonce Knowles and films like Real Women Have Curves have sought to celebrate the bodies of the average woman of color. However, there are statistics that show that four out of five black women are overweight or obese. It's a trend that may have more to do with food access than bad eating habits. I spoke with Tanya Fields of The Black Project, a food justice organization based out of the Bronx, about this issue of food access. But first, we'll see this piece about Michaela Angela Davis. She's an image activist who works to promote positive images among people of color. Davis has joined the growing ranks of black women who are starting programs around the country to get healthy. So, okay, so then we've got the garlic popping, right? And I just put the greens right in. Michaela Angela Davis has made eating fresh and healthy food a part of her daily life. This will last my dope daughter and I halfway through the week. The 48-year-old also maintains a consistent exercise regimen. Two, eyes full. But she's not doing it alone. Last December, the image activist teamed up with her friends and started a workout campaign called 30 for 30. Her goal was to get black women moving. We launched this 30 for 30 and we encourage people to do 30 minutes of exercise or movement for 30 days, that's it. Even if you put on music and freestyle dance and you just move for 30 minutes, like feel who you are, feel your body again, and we got you and we're connected. Then she began a healthy There's eating a mission it, called you know, Fresh Friday. Fresh food, when you think about it, really is prettier. The challenge, eat only fresh and non-processed foods on Fridays. Davis and other participants use social media to attract black women around the country to the program. They share information on healthy meals and photos of their workouts using catchy hashtags like fit is fly and fresh is fly. Three, go. She was moved to action when she learned a few alarming statistics. According to the Centers for Disease Control, African-American women have the highest obesity and diabetes rates compared to other groups in the U.S. In 2010, black women were 70% more likely to be obese than non-Hispanic white women. We're dying from preventable things. It's like we didn't survive the institution of slavery and Jim Crow and the civil rights movement to kill ourselves at dinner. Beyond the nutritious menus and workout sessions, she also enlisted the support of Peak Performance Gym in Manhattan to hold a series of seminars called What's Eating Black Women? What she's found is that even among African-American women from high income brackets, issues like depression and feelings of isolation at some neighborhood gyms play a major part in the health and fitness disparity. We found that there were re a lot of really practical reasons why some black women weren't working out. They didn't feel safe in certain spaces working out, that their bodies were so exoticized, like you go into one of these really elite gyms and you're the only super curvy girl in there that they've ever seen aside from Kim Kardashian and there's all this attention on you. So if we roll together, you know, if there's two or three or four of you, it creates a different story, right? A, it's fun. B, you have some protection. Davis isn't alone in her pursuit. Across the country, black women are banding together in different ways to change the way the community regards healthy eating and fitness. Like an Atlanta-based mother-daughter duo who recently released a DVD titled Black Girls Workout 2. And a growing movement called Black Girls Run, which started out as an online fitness blog. Today, the organization has over 70 run groups throughout the country. I use a low-fat um, olive oil spray. Davis uh, says the response to her campaign has been spray. overwhelming, so but there have spray. been some challenges. The food piece is a little bit harder, so we have to be much more consistent and a little bit more creative in how we present how to eat because we literally find people don't know. They really don't. They go in, down the aisle f of produce and don't know what to do. She plans to launch another month of 30 for 30 this spring. She's also in talks to get sponsorship to host a black girl boot camp. I think really what's missing is this sense of support and sisterhood and community and that we're not going to leave you like this is this is not 
going to be just a moment. Like we want to be fit and fly and fresh to death till the day we rest. So, eight. so Tanya, as an activist, you've been advocating for urban communities that don't have access to healthy food. How do you think that possibly plays a role in the high number of obesity rates among black women? Um, I think there's two things, right? So I think, you know, watching the clip with uh, Michaela and n knowing her work, I think, you know, we, you know, she t taps a little bit and talks about, like, institutional racism, this sort of, um, this idea that many of us are sort of survivors of many of the traumas that present itself in, in, in this country and manifest in our communities. And that also extends to food. And so, if you look at our food system, it's never been fair, it's never been equitable. The actual beginning of this country was very much uh, about being sort of on the backs and exploitation of indigenous people and, and enslaved Africans. And so, when you disconnect people from the land, when you disconnect them from their culture of food, then that really starts this whole idea of disconnecting them from their culture. And so I think that many folks, many indigenous folks, and many folks of color around the world have always sort of had this idea of like, you know, collards, yams. These all came from the continent of Africa. These are all things that we ate in a very healthy way. And then we experienced the trauma of oppression, and food in many times became an outlet for, um, feeling that sense of protection, feeling that sense of wanting to feel good, this idea of comfort food, and also just trying to do a lot with a little bit, right? Um, and on top of that, then there's been a very deliberate uh, an intentional um, campaign, if you will, uh, by big agriculture to put poor quality foods in low-income communities, despite whatever race they might be. But when you think about that and think about the fact that this is a country that where race certainly does correlate with um, income, then of course you have a recipe, no pun intended, for um, uh, unhealthy uh, eating habits, unhealthy lifestyles in terms of lack of activity, um, and and people not having access to the foods that... So wait, yeah. you're out in the community working. Mm -hmm. Give mm -hmm. us an idea of how bad this problem is in terms of the so, lack of access. You know, if you find me on Instagram, I actually have gone on a one woman campaign to expose many of the foods that are available and being sold at relatively high prices in the community. I went in and went to go get strawberries for my children. And as I've, because I've learned through experience, don't just pick them up and go buy them, open them up and look at them. Well, one, they are full of mold, right? Some have maggots on the bottom. Um, you're paying $2 a bunch a small bunch of broccoli, and it's wearing a blue fur coat. Um, you are looking at scallions that are limp. You are looking at, if there are collard greens and kale, they're full of holes, they're starting to turn brown. This is what is being passed off as food in many communities like mine. And so if you're a person who is low income, working class, every dollar counts, well then you're not gonna spend your hard earned money um, or the little bit of money that you have from food stamps on that type of produce. So what you will do are buy things that are shelf uh, stable, shelf life stable, which means you're looking at tons of sugar, tons of salt. Um, and then the piece that Michaela talked about as well, also if you're coming from sort of cyclical poverty where this has been the purchasing habits of your family, then you may not even know how to prepare the, the produce that, that, is, that is in front of you. I've heard you say on another video um, that food trucks pass by a lot of the neighborhoods, the urban neighborhoods that you're working for. Can you explain that and how that works? So I was talking specifically about my community, um, which is very ironic when you talk about food hardship, because my community, Hunts Point in the Bronx, is called the Bread Basket, because the largest food distribution center in the world exists not even a mile away from me. Um, we get 16,000 diesel truck trips every day. Um, mo the majority of them going back and forth to the distribution center. Baldor, very high-end sort of specialty boutique food line is in my community. All of these different things are in my community. They, in, they uh, contribute to the negative uh, air quality, um, but we don't get that food. So we don't even have access to the food that might be able in some small way to offset many of the environmental impacts that exist 
um, of this food coming back and forth. So my community literally feeds the northeast corridor of this country, and we can't even go into the fine fair or the sea town and find these things in, in the aisles of the supermarket. Wow. For years, we've been hearing about food deserts. Can you explain what that is and why some communities are left out? Well, I actually um, don't like the word food desert particularly because I think that it is a word that has been propagandized by large uh, grocery store chains as an excuse to bring in large grocery stores, which a lot of times if you've got a Whole Foods or really fancy a Cinderella comes into your community, that probably means gentrification is right on the heels of that. And so I want to think about food in a way where people who live in our communities have access to food and also are stakeholders in um, being able to uh, benefit from the economic development opportunities that present uh, themselves when new businesses, uh, particularly new food businesses, come in. But to get down to the definition of what a food desert is, what it essentially means is that a com certain communities, low-income communities, low-income communities of color many times, um, within a geographic region, don't have access to healthy, affordable, culturally relevant food in their communities. It, what it looks like is that means certain communities, I actually was in Hudson, New York um, this weekend, which is actually upstate, and there was no grocery store within the city limits. And so for poor people, or low income people, or working class people in that town that don't have cars, then they have to buy their food at the bodega. It means that people in my community who say, this, you know, the local grocery store is, 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 is not adequate, it means that they would then have to drag their children on a train or a bus, buy groceries, drag them along with their children back on a train or a bus back into the communities. Well, that's not feasible for many people. So what it means is that they are then relegated to having to either purchase low quality food that may not be nutritionally fit for their families um, or and, and many or many times they're just buying whatever they can and that they can afford at the gas station, the bodegas and um, low quality uh, hot hot food retailers. So the Chinese place, the fried chicken place, the um, you know, the uh, you know, the, the coochie Frito spot. <laughs> So as an activist, what kind of work have you been doing to help correct the issue? So there's a so my, my organization, The Black Project, um, really is about how do we create economic development opportunities for low-income uh, women and youth. Because when you're looking at poverty in many communities, then it does really have a very feminine face. And so when we've really thought about how do we create pathways out of poverty, um, sort of attack this issue that is present within poverty, which really um, sort of exists around food justice and food sovereignty and, you know, food apartheid, as I like to call it. Um, we started thinking about what were some of the things in our community that were actually looked at as blights, but that could be access. So we started looking at a lot of the underdeveloped land in our community and thinking about how do we work with urban farmers and community gardeners who are growing food to create a network of sort of food purveyors that we had uh, previously overlooked. And then how do we look at the undeveloped land and actually create new safe green spaces that grow food? So right now we're working with our local councilwoman um, to get a uh, urban farm in our community in Community District 2, which is, you know, Hunts Point, Longwood, and parts of Mott Haven. Um, and uh, it's called the Libertad Urban Farm. You know, Libertad is a Spanish word for like liberty, freedom. Um, and so we've been working on that. Um, and it's very difficult in New York City to, to get you know, property, even if it's underdeveloped. The other really big campaign that we're working on now is that um, we are raising money um, to uh, create a veggie mobile market. So we have a bus, ironically called Sugar Cube, <laughs> um, that was an old school bus that we've repainted. She runs on vegetable oil, so we're really thinking about making sure that as we bring food into our community, that we're not contributing to poor air quality. And uh, we are going to deck her out with uh, solar panels and storage and a refrigeration unit and get a couple Vitamixes so we can make smoothies. What areas will she be um, in? She will go around the South Bronx. So we're going to hit, you know, Mott Haven, Grand Concourse, Hunts Point, Longwood, you know, Kingsbridge, all of these places where you've got low income and working class people of color who want, you know, produce. Thank you so much for being on the show, Tanya. Thank you for having me.